In this video, we're going to take a hands-on look at Spring Boot, JPA, and MySQL. A nice thing that we can do with Spring Boot, JPA, and MySQL is we can start with an empty database, and by that I mean there are no tables inside of it. And then we can use some annotations that we use to decorate our DTO, our data transfer object, and we can have Spring Boot automatically make the table to match the DTO and do all of the effort in persisting our DTO and even retrieving our DTO simply by defining an interface. It's really quick. Uh, this video is going to be over in probably about 25 minutes, which is, includes all of the annotations and uh, actually watching all of this work. This is a live example, so I'm just going to quickly hit a few bullet points in this presentation and then we'll jump right in. So first of all, why do we want to use JPA? automatically map the DTO to the database. We don't have to think about putting together some kind of SQL statement with string concatenation. Uh, Spring Boot JPA handles that for us. We can create a database on the fly. Now our database admins might not like that very much because they might want to architect it, so we certainly can connect to an existing database. But if we think about a microservice where we want to get a service set up and running very quickly and we want to be able to persist data very quickly, uh, this is a great option if we just need to fire something up quickly. So we'll look at automatic, automatic creation in this video. In other videos, we'll take a look at a few other options as well. So after just one more slide of a little bit of an overview, we're going to jump right into a live demo. So here's what we need. We need to have a database installed. And in a previous video, I walked through installing MySQL as part of the WAMP stack, Windows Apache, PHP, MySQL, and also using the uh, PHP My Admin tool to set that up. I did another video where we created a user, and that's the user that we're going to define in this video. Then we need to set up a little bit of configuration information in our application properties file in our Spring Boot application. All we need to do is say, what's the URL to our database, the username and password of the user, and a driver. That's it, four lines, easy. We need to have a DTO, which I've created in a previous video, and then we use some simple annotations on that DTO. So uh, at entity says this is a DTO or data transfer object, Java Bean, whatever you want to call it, and I want this DTO to persist to a database. Uh, at ID and at generated value says this is the primary key, and I want to auto generate the primary key for this. Okay, now uh, with Spring Boot, we know that we can set things up with Spring Initializer and that will generate something called a POM XML, which has all of our Maven dependencies. But we also have the option to go back and edit that POM XML and add a few more dependencies. Now, the last part's probably the most fun. What about the, our CRUD operations? Create, retrieve, update, delete? All we need to do is extend an interface called CRUD repository and give it a couple of generic identifiers, and Spring does a lot of magic to implement a save method for us and those other CRUD methods as well. It's amazing because all you have to do is extend an interface, just takes a few lines of code. So without further ado, let's jump right in. Now, a lot of this is built on a project I've been working on through several videos. So I do want to give you a quick overview of the architecture that we're working with here because I have to jump through several different layers. So quick intro. First of all, we'll have some kind of look and feel, could be HTML, could be mobile app, we're not going to consider that as part of this video. Uh, we just know that that view is going to hit some kind of endpoint, which is in a controller. Controller is part of our model view controller architecture. The controller, which does things like handle button clicks and events, will call down to a service layer, which is like a business logic layer. The service layer calls down to the data access object layer, which is like a persistence layer. So at this point, we've already built out a lot of these classes. And in this video, we're simply going to be adding to those classes. Now, uh, in a previous video, we created our database in MySQL and PHP MyAdmin. And what we're going to add in this video is a new interface which extends from CRUD repository. We are going to call that new interface from our DAO. Then we're going to call that DAO method from our service layer and call the service layer from our controller. At the very end of the video, we're going to test things out in a debugger by hitting the controller endpoint. We're going to watch it walk into the service layer. We're going to watch it walk into the DAO. And then for our success criteria, we're going to go look at this database and confirm that we see our table with our new DTO inside of that table stored as data. We won't debug into the CRUD repository because a lot of that is just generated for us by Spring under the covers. So that's a look from controller to service to DAO to the CRUD repository from Spring JPA, and then that will insert into our database.
First, just a reminder of some things we've done in some previous videos. I created an admin user that has all privileges, and I also created a database called Diary, but that database does not yet have tables in it. Now back to our project. We know that one advantage of Spring Boot is it's very light on configuration because in most cases it simply assumes some defaults. But what if we actually do need to configure something? What if the default is not right for us? Well, in that case, we go to this file called application.properties, and what you see right here is a beautiful application.properties because it's empty, because we're just using all of the defaults. But nonetheless, when we connect to a database, we do need to add a couple things, specifically with Spring JPA. So I'll expand this to give us a bit more room. Spring JPA Hibernate DDL Auto. You notice it gives me an autocomplete here, and then it gives me yet another autocomplete, which is really cool. Uh, so there are several options that we have here, and this says when we run our application and it looks at our DTOs, does it need to make a table to store those DTOs, or does the table already exist, or does it need to update a table that already exists? So these are our options. The most common option here is none, and that means that we have created the database and the schema for that database separately from this program, which is most often the case. But we have a few other options as well. One is create. And create says, we're going to create the database tables based off the names of our DTOs and the names of their attributes. We're going to create those tables automatically. This is ideal if you just need to store a little bit of information and you're not really worried about tuning or optimizing the database. If you have, say, a local cache or something like that. None is more common because more often a data architect is going to architect the database and then we'll build software on top of that. And none means that our software won't change the database. Create means that the database will look like our DTOs. Create drop is another option, which means it's going to create a database that looks like our DTOs, and then it's going to drop the database when the session factory closes, where the session factory is essentially what keeps our database connection alive while our program's running. So why in the world would you want to drop something when that session factory closes? Well, here again, maybe it's temporary data. Maybe it's a local cache of data that lives somewhere else, and, and that's, the, uh, that's where that would happen. Update is another option. Update means that this database table probably exists, but compare it to my DTO. See if the DTO has changed. Maybe we've added a new attribute to the DTO. If we have, then let's have Spring JPA update the database with a new column that represents that attribute. So several options. The one we're going to try out is create. Now we need to add some connection information. Spring data source. URL equals. This is going to be a JDBC URL, which follows a fairly standard syntax, JDBC colon MySQL, because this is a MySQL database, colon, slash, slash, on the US keyboard, that's the slash on the question mark key. Now, this lives at our local computer, so we can either use 127.0.0.1, which is the localhost IP address, or we can simply type in localhost. And then colon 3306 is the default MySQL port, and I haven't changed that, so let's leave that at 3306. Finally, one more slash, and let's put on the database name, which we know is diary. A couple more lines we need. Spring data source, username. Remember we made an, a, user, a user called admin. We need the password as well. Now, a couple things here. When I made the password, I didn't tell you what it was. It was on a separate video. You're going to see it now. It's uh, you know, Snoopy14, not a very serious password, but one that's easy to remember. So Snoopy14+. plus. Now I'm going to pause here for just a moment and I want to think about something. I've just put a password, not my real password, but a dummy password, into a text file. And in just a moment, I'm going to push this up to GitHub. Let's say that you had sensitive information in this file that you didn't want to push to GitHub. How would you prevent that from getting pushed to GitHub? Easy. Just go to the git ignore file and we can add an entry there. One thing that we want to consider is that this file, this specific file application.properties is required for our program to run. So if we remove it from git ignore, we need to make sure that we have a different version of application.properties on every platform where this will run. And that's fairly common 
In a version control scenario, in a CICD scenario, in many kind of development scenarios, you might have an application properties that is local to your development environment on your laptop that you don't want to commit and push because it might have an IP address that's specific to your computer or so on and so forth might uh, have a password that's specific to you. When you commit and push your code up to test, there should be an application properties file for that environment. And then there should be one for pre-prod or cert or stage, whatever you call that. And then a different one for production. So that's one way to handle it. I won't do any of that in this video because I have plenty to cover in this video already, but I do have a different video that shows a similar example in C Sharp where I put an API key into a text file and then I just brought that API key via that text file into my program and then I simply hid that text file that had the API key using git ignore. So I'll point you over to that. Just want to point that out since I am putting a password in something that's going to go to GitHub. And generally that's considered a no-no, especially for a public repository. At this point, I'm happy with the application properties file, so I'm going to save it. Now let's remember early on in this presentation, I showed a slide that had several layers of our application from UI to controller to service to DAO. The Spring Boot logic that we have is going to belong in the DAO layer because it is persistence. I created this DAO stub a while back so that I could write some unit tests and I could write the other layers of my application. And we see what this is doing is the save method is simply saving to a local map of specimens. We want to actually save this to a database. So I am going to just make a new class that implements that very same interface. And this is a SQL implementation. So let's say specimen SQL DAO, something like that. That will allow us to do other things like a NoSQL impl implementation if we want in the future. We could also call it specimen DAO, specimen DAO impl. There's several things that we could call it. Sure, let's add it to Git and let's implement Implement our interface size specimen DAO, and that will give us several of our methods. And the first one that we're concerned with is this save method. You notice it's accepting a specimen object. At the moment, it's returning null. Somehow, we need to get the details from that specimen object into a table that's going to be in our MySQL database that we can see here through PHP MyAdmin. So we need to get from here to there. And it actually doesn't take a whole lot of lines of code, which is really nice and one of the big advantages of Spring JPA. What we need to do is create one more interface in this DAO. And this is where we're really going to see how interfaces can help us do a lot with not a lot of typing. Because remember that an interface is just a list of methods. This is going to be a very special interface, though, because it's going to have a super interface. Think about how we can have a subclass and a superclass. We can have the same thing with interfaces. We can have an interface that extends from another interface. But there again, remember that an interface is just a list of methods. So if an interface does have a super interface, then the sub interface is merely a collection of all the methods that have been defined in the interface itself and all of its super interfaces. I know that might be a little bit confusing. I apologize for that. Uh, but I just want to give a little explanation because if you don't have that in advance, the idea of an interface extending an interface is kind of confusing. So we're going to make an interface called specimen repository because we're really storing specimen. And now here's the important part. I mentioned that we need to have a superclass repository, so we're going to say extends CRUD repository. CRUD repository is a spring concept that we're going to need to get through Maven. So I take a look here. It doesn't know what CRUD repository is. I'm going to choose add Maven dependency. Well, rats, it didn't find it under CRUD repository. I'll make sure I spelled it right because that is a tricky word. Let me go to search for artifact instead. We'll look for spring boot starter data JPA. And this should be in the group ID org.springframework.boot, which is what you see here in gray. So yeah, this looks good. Let's go ahead and add this one. Want to add one more as well. So I'm going to go ahead and alt enter and add Maven dependency. We'll search for artifact and we're going to look for MySQL connector Java. Uh, once again, there we go. That one looks pretty good. Should be in the MySQL group ID, which once again we see over here in gray. 
MySQL group ID, MySQL connector Java, just grab the latest. When you do this, you might find your numbers a little higher than mine, but nonetheless, we'll go ahead and add. Let's go ahead and hit the refresh, load Maven changes. And after all that, I realized I misspelled CRUD repository. It's not repository. Let's make it right. Repository. There we go. Might have been even easier than I thought. Nonetheless, we got, it, we got it this time, and we got to find another way to add items to our palm, which was a good exercise in itself. The good news is from here, it's quite straightforward. So first of all, uh, I'm going to give this two generic identifiers. The first generic identifier is what I'm planning to save to a database. The second generic identifier is the unique ID data type for what I'm planning to save to a database. So what am I planning to save? Well, easy. This specimen right here, our specimen DTO, is defined in our DTO package. So I say specimen. We'll go ahead, Alt-Enter to import that. And then the identifier type on that, it's simply an integer because it's that specimen ID. You might remember we refactored that once in code review and changed it from a string to an int. Let's use the box type, which is integer. Now the first thing that we want to do is save our specimens so that we can confirm that it saves to the database. Believe it or not, if we just want to save, we've done all we need to do with this repository. You see there are no methods in here, but remember we are extending from CRUD repository, and CRUD repository does provide methods to us. This is what CRUD repository looks like under the covers, and you can see it has a save method, save all, find by ID, exist by ID, find all, find all by ID, count, delete by ID, several different things. But this is really weird because we know that this CRUD repository class is something that was created before our application was created. So how does it know what it's saving, what it's finding, and so on and so forth? Well, it's this generic type that tells it what. You can see here that it's returning a type that extends that first generic identifier. Could extend, could be the same. And then the ID is used in the find by IDs. So if we go back and take a look at our repository, maybe that helps to make more sense. We want to save one of these. We want to fetch it or delete it by one of these. This is a really good application or use case where we can see that as long as we apply some standards and some naming conventions, we can get a whole lot of stuff for free. Now let's wire this up to our DAO. In our DAO, just as we've done before, we're going to use an at auto wired annotation. And above that, or below that rather, we'll say specimen repository, specimen repository. Now, a funny thing, we know that auto wired and at component go together. In this case, we don't need an at component annotation on the specimen repository because it's an interface. And remember that an interface cannot be an object. We can't make an object out of an interface. Instead, we're going to count on Spring Boot to take this interface and make an object out of it in the background and provide that to us. Okay, now let's go to Save, Specimen Repository. Save, look at that. You see our method's already there. Isn't that amazing? Even though we didn't make it, it's already there. And it knows that it should take a specimen. And what does this return? Control-Alt-V in, in IntelliJ IDEA will figure out the return type and create a variable for us and assign the return value of that method to that variable as we see here. So we'll say created specimen is what gets returned and we will simply return created specimen. I'm going to add a repository annotation on the top. And so far repository annotations have been pretty much empty. I'm going to add a qualifier in here, specimen DAO. And what that means is it's kind of helping spring out. It says, hey, if you have an auto wire that's trying to populate a specimen DAO variable type or name, why don't you fill it with this guy? Reason why I'm doing that is that if you noticed, I now have two different classes that implement the same interface. So it's not very clear to spring if I have an auto wired annotation above an interface as I do here, it's not very clear to spring which one of these to pick to instantiate. So adding that text just kind of helps it out a little bit. Okay, we look good there. One more thing we want to take care of is our DTO. So we know we have the Lombok annotation on there right now, which gives us our getters and setters. We're going to add a few more. We'll start with at entity, and we put that above the class declaration itself. And that says, I want to be stored in a database. So it essentially is just 
indicating that we want to be stored. And Java X persistence.entity is what we need. Now, funny thing, as soon as we add that entity annotation, we get a red line on specimen because it says persistent entity specimen should have a primary key. So a couple more things we're going to do. We're going to annotate one of our attributes with at ID, which essentially makes it a primary key. And the red line goes away. We're also going to say at generated value, which tells it what to do if there's nothing in this ID. So generated value, we'll see strategy. Well, first of all, let's import it. And then we'll say strategy equals generation type dot auto. Now I realize now I put it above plant ID, which is the unique ID for a plant, but not a specimen. So I'm going to just rearrange a little bit. As a matter of fact, let's make specimen ID the very first attribute because that is the primary key and it is one we want to highlight. Now let's deploy and try it out. First of all, remember what our database looks like in advance. There's just a database there. There's no tables or anything like that. Now we go over to our application. We say, okay, pawpaw fruit season. We'll just leave this at the default. We hit submit. Now let's go back and refresh PHP my admin. Holy smokes, look at that. You see, we now have a table called specimen. And if we click into this, what do we see? A column called specimen ID with a value of one. Description, pawpaw fruit season. Latitude 3974, longitude minus 8451, and then plant ID 84. So what's important about this is you see that it created this table. It inserted the row into the table in a SQL-based table at that, and we didn't have to write a single line of SQL. This is probably easiest to watch through a live demo, so let's take a look through the debugger. I've snapped a breakpoint on the save method in the controller in IntelliJ IDEA. We'll see that in just a moment. Let me go ahead and make some distinct value here. So we'll say latitude 64. We'll give it uh, Greenland latitude. And we'll give it minus 77.01. Description, dwarf, fireweed, and bloom. My virtual machine can't get to the data feed for our plant autocomplete, so I'm not going to worry about that. It's, we'll leave that at the default. And then specimen, we could leave that at 1003, or we could just leave it blank. Doesn't really matter because we told Spring Boot to just auto-generate a specimen ID. I'll leave it at 1003 for now. Let's hit submit and watch the debugger. So first of all, uh, notice that we're going to hit the save specimen endpoint, and let me just confirm that by going to view source and then save specimen. Let's take a look at where our debugger is. No surprise here, it is in the save specimen endpoint. And once again, this is the controller. Remember the controller is our entry point for all of our endpoints. We're going from controller to service to DAO to repository. So watch as I press F7 through these. First of all, controllers on top, F7. And now we see that we've gone to specimen service. Okay, F7 for specimen DAO, and it goes into a bit of what we call aspect-oriented programming here, which is a little bit crazy. So what I'm going to do is simply snap a breakpoint right here in the specimen SQL DAO. So we got that. Now what I can do, because I don't want to go through all this interceptor stuff, is I'm going to hit F9, and that's going to take me right to the specimen SQL DAO. One thing I want to point out while we're here is remember we just came from this specimen service stub and remember that we have that auto wired on I specimen DAO and both specimen DAO stub and specimen SQL DAO implement that interface so they could both be candidates for being objects into this variable. We wanted the specimen SQL DAO, so remember we added a qualifier to this repository, a uh, qualifier in quotes actually, to the repository to kind of give Spring a bit of a hint. Nonetheless, here we are down in our data and are about to call the database. So before I continue on this, let's just go back and take a look at the database and make sure nothing's changed. I hit refresh and we see that we still have our one record there from earlier. So in IntelliJ, I'm going to choose F8, which will save our new specimen into the database. We go back and refresh and take a look. Dwarf, fireweed, and bloom. Latitude 64, longitude 7701, and then plant ID, we said we were going to default that. And then specimen ID, it did generate one for us as well instead of using our 1003. You might notice it skipped a number there. 
I'd skip the number two. That's just because I paused the video to do a quick dry run to make sure this was all going to work before I showed it to you. And then I went back and deleted it. So it actually did create one that was number two. But at this point, I can choose F9 because we have proven out that we can persist our specimens to a database. And even more than that, we've proven out that all we need to do is create the database. And we can let Spring JPA handle creating the table inside of it and also creating the SQL statements to take our object and push our object into that database. We've only done a save here, and we do know that there are more CRUD operations. When we look at our specimen SQL DAO, we see we filled out the save, not the fetch all, the fetch, or the delete. So a few more things that we need to do, but not to worry, there are more videos coming. So I hope this one was helpful, and I look forward to reading your comments. Thank you.